How is this so hard to understand? I mean, seriously, how can this be so... How stupid do you have to be to not understand? Flat earthers are probably the most deluded science deniers I've ever come across. While creationists deny specific things about the scientific method, specifically that one can confirm a hypothesis regarding the past by observing the present, flat earthers go so far as to reject easily observable facts as well, something not even new agers will do. Yeah. Okay. Look, anyway, obviously there's no way to convince someone who is so deluded that they will deny things that they can clearly see and test repeatedly. So that's not my goal here. Instead, I simply want to talk about what these people believe and, most importantly, how we know that they're wrong. When you ask most people how they know that the Earth is round, they'll probably refer to pictures of the Earth as seen from space. Of course, flat earthers claim that these are all fake. But even if they were all fake, every single one, that still wouldn't matter. Contrary to what flat earthers will claim, we've known that the Earth was round for a lot longer than we've been able to go high enough to actually take pictures that show the curvature of the Earth directly. The first observation that led the more well-educated people of the ancient world to understand that the Earth was at least curved, if not necessarily spherical, was probably that as you move to higher ground, things that were previously below the horizon become visible. The fact that this is the case in every direction indicates that the surface of the Earth curves down away from you in all directions. This is an observation I'm confident that every flat earther has made, but of course they'll deny it, since it proves that at least the Earth is not a flat disk, as they say. Another observation easily made by ancient civilizations is the circular shadow the Earth casts on the Moon during a lunar eclipse. These only occur during full Moon when, incidentally, the Sun and the Moon are directly opposite to each other in the sky. The Earth gets in the way and casts a roughly circular shadow on the Moon, not a highly eccentric one, as it would if the Earth were a circular disk. Nor is the shape of the shadow consistent with the Earth having any other shape than a spheroid. When the Book of Isaiah was written, around 600 BCE, the average person in the Middle East probably still believed that the Earth was a flat circular disk, as clearly described in that book, which is obviously why it was written the way it was. However, modern fundamentalist Christians will be quick to point out that circle actually means sphere, or, well, it's just a way to describe the Earth that the people of the time would understand. And it's very likely that the educated people in 600 BCE felt the same way. A few hundred years later, however, the ancient Greeks were definitely well aware of the shape of the Earth, and not just the exceptionally well-educated among them. If nothing else, they were all familiar with ships appearing to sink or rise as they passed the horizon, an observation the goat herders of the Fertile Crescent probably hadn't made. An observation that flat earthers, incidentally, reject. They either say it doesn't happen, or they say it's just an optical illusion, but they provide no explanation for how this illusion works. Around 200 BCE, the Greek philosopher Eratosthenes calculated the Earth's circumference by looking at the length of a shadow in Alexandria at the summer solstice, when he knew that the sun was in zenith in Syene, 800 kilometers south of there. Of course, more recent measurements give a more accurate result, but he was not far off at all. This is an experiment I would challenge any flat earther to make. On a flat earth, the lengths of shadows of similar objects in Alexandria and Syene would be practically the same, unless the sun were so close that shadows would visibly diverge, which they don't. Of course, flat earthers today either look at parallel shadows and deny that they're parallel, or they reject the conclusion of the experiment by rejecting high school geometry. Either way, they reject what is easily and directly demonstrable, and they won't accept this challenge, not even to spite me after hearing me say this. Instead, they will come up with excuses for why they can't personally accept the challenge. I can't travel far enough because it'll cost too much, or 
I would, but I don't have the time to spare. And since they wouldn't believe anyone else who says it turned out the way I predicted, that means they can't be convinced that they're wrong. They won't put their beliefs to the test, but they'll still claim that they know the truth and have proof that the Earth is flat. The next few observations made historically that confirm that the Earth is indeed a spheroid are also observations that anyone can make if you're just willing to travel. But as we've established, flat earthers aren't. First off, it's possible to sail around the Earth. Now this isn't the convincing part, because flat earthers believe that north means toward the center of the disc-shaped Earth, and east and west simply refer to the directions perpendicular to north. What should be convincing, however, is what happens when you cross the equator, which the Europeans had to do in order to sail around the world prior to the building of the Suez and Panama canals. Turns out the stars on the southern hemisphere don't appear to orbit Polaris, but a point near the star Sigma Octantis. And they're not the same stars. Also, the moon is upside down. And here's the real kicker. Paths on the southern hemisphere converge as they go further south, just like on the northern hemisphere when they go further north. This cannot be if the Earth is a flat disk, or any shape other than a spheroid. Today, the fact that paths converge on the southern hemisphere is undeniable, since as anyone with a cash to blow could confirm, you can travel to the South Pole from either Punta Arenas, Chile, or Cape Town, South Africa. Yes, tours are offered commercially, though they'll set you back some $50,000. Still, the fact remains that you'll reach the same point whether you go from Africa or South America, which flat earthers say you won't. But you don't have to go all the way to the South Pole, just travel around the Antarctic, or just from South Africa to Argentina, and you'll notice that the trip is a lot shorter than Flat Earthers will claim. Another thing travelers would notice is that if you do travel around the world, you will gain or lose a full day. I'm not talking about time dilation here, I mean, you'd simply be wrong about what the current date is. This is, of course, because you have traveled through what we today refer to as 24 different time zones. You will have crossed the date line. On a flat Earth, the sun is either up or down, period. It will be day everywhere on the disk or night everywhere on the disk. The sun rises and sets at the same time of day for everyone. There are no time zones. Excuses include that the sun is like a spotlight. But this obviously doesn't matter when you can clearly see how it rises and sets. The spotlight is either above the disk, above the horizon, or beneath it. It can't be above the horizon as seen from one point on the disk, but beneath it as seen from another. And that's a magical property that spotlights don't actually have. While on the subject of magic, that's what flat earthers would have to cite in order to explain why gravity behaves the way it does. They will argue that the Earth, and presumably everything else in the universe, accelerates upwards at 1g. This fails to explain why everything in the universe behaves as though massive bodies attract each other. It also fails to explain why gravity is weaker at high altitude and near the equator. This is of course because the strength of gravity depends on the distance to the center of mass, which isn't the same everywhere on the Earth's surface since it's not a perfect sphere. And it definitely isn't the same if you're a significant distance above the surface either. Nor can they explain the horizon. On a flat Earth, the horizon would be the edge, or where the firmament meets the Earth. Yes, they believe in that, at least some of them. But then we shouldn't see things disappear across the horizon, since they don't cross the horizon until they fall off the Earth. Some flat earthers have claimed that the reason you can't see across the Atlantic is that the atmosphere becomes opaque over such a great distance. But this also means that that's the reason why ships disappear. But they wouldn't appear to sink in that case. Instead, the wavelengths of light reflecting off it would be gradually filtered out, first violet, then blue, and along the spectrum all the way to red. Just like how the sky becomes red at sunset, when the sunlight has to travel further through the atmosphere than in the middle of the day. Eventually red would be filtered out as well, and the ship would simply fade away. But we would still be able to detect it on our radar, since radio waves are way longer than red light. And of course we can't. But here's the funniest part. Why, if this were the case, can we see celestial bodies supposedly attached to the firmament, which is further away than the ship? that is too far away to be seen. 
Magic, bitch. That's why. So in conclusion, the idea that the Earth is round does not come from NASA or the government or the Illuminati or whatever you want to claim. It's been known for a very long time. Pictures of the Earth from space aren't the deciding piece of evidence, it's just the final nail in the coffin for the claim that the Earth is flat. But you know what? When it comes to those pictures, you don't even have to trust NASA or any other government agency anymore, because private enterprises have sent rockets into space. Not even that conspiracy claim holds up. Not even that excuse holds up. Next time, we're going to have a look at some specific claims Flat Earthers make. See you then.